met Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle in the last lecture. The idea that we can't ever both know the location and velocity of a particle as small as an electron at the same time. Let me assure you that this strange idea is not the only unsettling prediction that quantum theory makes. Since 1911, every three years or so, a small faction of the world's most eminent physicists gathers at the Solvay Institutes in Brussels for an invitation-only discussion of the major problems in physics. In 1927, at the fifth conference, out of the 29 attendees, 17 had been or would be Nobel Prize winners. Only one was a woman. She was also the only one in that group to win two Nobel Prizes, and that was in two different disciplines. The topic that year was electrons and photons, and quantum theory was about to be accepted as the future of physics. The list of attendees reads like the roster of an all-star team of paradigm-shifting physicists. Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Max Born, Paul Dirac, Max Planck, Wolfgang Pauli, Niels Bohr, Hendrik Lorentz, and Marie Curie, our doubly honored Nobel laureate batting cleanup. Just to name the starting lineup. It was at this conference that Einstein, uncomfortable with the implications of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, famously quipped, God does not play dice with the universe. Niels Bohr apparently replied, Einstein, stop telling God what to do. Of course, we now know that Einstein was wrong. Not that we know what God does or doesn't do, but that the uncertainty principle holds, at least in the nanoscopic realm of our universe. Richard Feynman, one of the 20th century's greatest theoretical physicists, was once asked to explain a concept from quantum mechanics to a professorial colleague. He promised to prepare a freshman-level lecture on the topic, but returned after a few days empty-handed. I couldn't do it, he said, which means we don't really understand it. That's still true of some of the ideas bound, bandied about in quantum theory, but I've already described some of the things that we do know about quantum mechanics in previous lectures. For example, we've talked about the way that light can act both as a wave and a particle, and how the electron orbitals around the nucleus of an atom can only be determined probabilistically. How uncertainty plays a major role in quantum physics, as in Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and that photons have specific energy packets, or quanta, whose values are related to the wavelength of light. Each of these concepts is central to understanding quantum mechanics, and by sneaking them into other lectures, I've already laid the groundwork for a deeper understanding of this universally intriguing microscopic world. You're more than halfway there. So in this lecture, I'd like to spend a little more time exploring what we still don't know, in addition to more about what we think we do know. In science, as we've seen, it's just as important to know the boundary of our knowledge as it is to know the information itself. We know a lot about the universe, but there's a lot more that we don't know. And it's our ignorance that drives science. No scientist wants to devote his or her life to categorizing or rehashing what's already known. Science is about investigating the unknown, which, it, which is what makes it so exciting and important. Quantum mechanics is the branch of physics that attempts to explain the behavior of very, very, very small things. I can't emphasize that enough. Our brain cells are pretty small, we can't see them without the aid of a powerful microscope. And the discrete contents of our brain cells are even smaller. The mitochondria, the cell membrane, the chromosomes in each nucleus that contain all of our genetic material. But compared to the scale of the quantum world, even an average-sized molecule is big. It's 10 times larger than an atom. And quantum mechanics applies to things that are even smaller than an atom. That's very, very, very small. The term quantum has been taken now to mean very small, but that's technically incorrect. Quantum actually describes a feature of the nanoscopic world that is both fundamental 
and intuitively puzzling. The fact that some physical properties can only change in discrete amounts. Photons contain packets of energy, quanta. Subatomic particles can have a positive or a negative charge, not three quarters of a charge. That's what's quantum about quantum mechanics, discrete amounts. For events in our day-to-day -day world and all the way down to the scale of molecules, classical physics predicts behavior very accurately. But that doesn't necessarily mean that quantum laws aren't still in effect. We just don't see them. We experience the macroscopic world as smooth. We can get a little hotter or run a little faster or feel a little sadder. We don't need to jump from one speed of jogging to another. We can accelerate gradually. To reach 350 degrees, our ovens first have to heat up to all the degree states in between cold and the final temperature. Things seem to be continuous, but that's because the quantum effects occur at the tiniest of scales. We observe light dimming as the sun goes down, but every photon that hits our retina has a discrete energy associated with it. The resolution of our retinas is simply not strong enough to distinguish between each photon. A movie is actually a series of still frames projected too quickly for our eyes to separate the images, resulting in an experience of a continuous moving picture. But if you slow the film down, eventually you'll see the individual frames. Our universe is granular, not smooth but we operate at a scale at which that granularity appears to be smooth and the laws of classical physics do apply. Quantum theory was born because these laws don't seem to apply to the subatomic world. In a series of imaginative insights, physicists at the beginning of the 20th century, frustrated with the inability of classical physics to predict the behavior of electrons and photons, began to think outside the box. They began to make wild, outlandish hypotheses like, what if light acts both as a particle and a wave? What if an electron can be in two places at the same time? Of course, none of these ideas would have stood the test of time without rigorous experimentation. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, as Carl Sagan and others have noted. And quantum theory has been subjected to varied testing methods and many lines of converging evidence. As an aside, however, you should be very wary of people using quantum mechanics to explain macroscopic phenomena that remain mysterious. Unless the evidence is extraordinary, there's no reason to think that the law of quantum mechanics apply. For example, Sometimes I hear people claim that consciousness can exist outside of the brain because quantum mechanics predicts that particles can become entangled or interact with each other even if they are at great distances apart. But there is simply no evidence that consciousness is a quantum phenomenon, that it has ever existed outside of a living brain. The ideas of quantum mechanics are sometimes too tempting as explanations for things that we wish were true or that we just don't understand yet. Why is this the case? Because quantum mechanics seems to hover beyond the realm of rational understanding. As one of our current eminent theoretical physicists, Brian Greene, writes, unlike relativity, few if any people ever grasp quantum mechanics at a soulful level. If no one understands it, what good is it then? To answer this question, we need to look back at why quantum mechanics appeared in the first place, the problems it was designed to solve, and how it's used today. As we've already discussed, quantum mechanics arose during attempts to explain certain phenomena at the nanoscopic level. Classical physics made predictions that time and time again were proven wrong during experimentation. The mathematical formulae and rules derived from the principles of quantum mechanics, in contrast, have made some of the most precise and accurate numerical predictions in the history of science. The soul of quantum mechanics is math. Neil Turok, another leading theoretical physicist, has this to say. 
As strange as it is, quantum theory has become the most successful, powerful, and accurately tested scientific theory of all time. It represents a triumph of abstract mathematical reasoning. Our ability to reason, to create mathematical predictions and test them appropriately extends our imagination beyond what we can visualize or what feels intuitively satisfying. Simply by observing the world, we mold it into a shape that we can relate to, that is representative of our experience, that is describable with ordinary numbers. Turok calls mathematics our third eye, allowing us to see and understand how things work in realms so remote from our experience that they can't be visualized. Quantum physics teaches us that in a very real sense, we all live in an imaginary reality. But this reality is riddled with landmines, and we can't jump around it willy-nilly without the risk of getting things disastrously wrong. So let's put aside the constraints of what we can visualize for the moment and take a few cautious steps down the rabbit hole. In 2011, at another exclusive gathering of eminent physicists, 33 of the attendees completed a survey on the state of quantum theory at that time. The results were published online in 2013 and were quickly called an embarrassment to modern physics. Why? Because when asked which interpretation of quantum mechanics is preferable, there wasn't anything resembling a consensus or even a majority opinion. The most popular interpretation garnered only 42% of the votes. The rest of the votes were scattered among many other alternatives. Cosmologist Sean Carroll responded to the results by bemoaning the fact that 90 years after the theory was proposed, we know how it works and it works extremely well, but we still don't know what it means. And yet the Copenhagen interpretation, the view that got the most votes, continues to be taught today as the foundational understanding of quantum mechanics. So we're going to explore how the Copenhagen interpretation came about and what its tenets are. Note that there are other interpretations, but none of them are quite as widely accepted as this one. The tenets were proposed by Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, and others in the years leading up to the Solvay Conference in 1927, and it was widely accepted at that meeting. Not, of course, by Albert Einstein, whose famous dice comment reflects his opinion at the time. If I was forced to describe the foundation of the interpretation in one sentence, I would say that it suggests that quantum mechanics is not built to describe objective reality, but that the act of measuring quanta forces the set of probabilities to randomly assume only one possible value. That's a long sentence. In a nutshell, by observing the quantum world, we force it to choose one of several possible paths. There have been several principles that have been attributed to the Copenhagen interpretation that are worth delving into. We'll consider each of them in turn. First, the best way to describe a system or a set of interacting components is by using a wave function that represents the state of the system and changes with time. For example, we can represent the stock market with a graph that shows how the stocks go up and down with time. Except when a measurement is made, a measurement, a measurement causes the waveform to collapse instantaneously into an observable, measurable state. At each particular point in time, each stock has a specific value. Because this state becomes definitive, a new term was invented to differentiate it from the probabilistic states. We call it an eigenstate from the German or Dutch word for inherent. Second, the description of nature is probabilistic at its core. We can't specify every aspect of it at once, just as we can't simultaneously know the position and velocity of an electron. So we use probabilities. We describe elements of the system in terms of their likelihood. At any given time, there's a 50% chance that a stock will be higher or lower than a minute ago, or something to that effect. Now, if we know more about the system, 
like the conditions that make the stock move in one direction or another, we can use that information to specify the probability. The jobs numbers were good this month, so the Dow Jones is more likely to be up than down. Third, we can't know all of the values of the properties of a system at the same time. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, restated in a different way. Those values that we don't know precisely are described in terms of probabilities. Fourth, as we've seen, matter acts both like a wave and like a particle, demonstrating wave-particle duality. When we experiment on matter, we can observe particle or wave-like behavior, and sometimes both at the same time. Fifth, when we measure things, we use the instruments of classical physics, and therefore, we only measure classical properties like position and momentum. And finally, in large systems, the quantum mechanical description will converge upon the classical physics description, this is what's called the correspondence principle. What classical physics predicts becomes the same as what quantum mechanics predicts when the components of the system are large. Classical physics and quantum mechanics make the same predictions, for example, as to what happens when a truck crashes into a car. But the predictions are different if the two crashing things are tiny, like two electrons, rather than big, like two vehicles. With these principles in hand, let's explore some of their implications and the paradoxes that they present. Starting with the wave function, the Copenhagen interpretation views this function as a theoretical concept, not necessarily a discrete entity. This view strongly dissociates the interpretation from a view of quantum physics through the lens of scientific realism. Here we have a divergence of opinions between Einstein on one side and Bohr and the others on the other, with respect to the purpose of science. To understand this disagreement, ask yourself the following question. How would you answer the question, how should we measure the success of science? If, on the one hand, you believe that an ideal scientific theory says definite things about genuinely existing entities, you're in Einstein's camp. If, on the other hand, you believe that a scientific theory should be instead evaluated by how well it explains and predicts phenomena, what we observe as opposed to what is objectively real, then you're in the Bohr camp. You're what's called an instrumentalist. Science is an instrument with which we can understand the world that we experience regardless of what its objective reality may be. In theoretical physics, Instrumentalism is more widely accepted than scientific realism, though you can have different views depending on the specific scientific discipline. For example, you can require biology to describe objective reality, but allow economics to explain and predict phenomena. In response to Bohr's interpretation of how to evaluate quantum mechanics, Einstein famously said, do you really think the moon isn't there if you aren't looking at it? This quote reflects our inherent discomfort with the instrumentalist viewpoint. But when it comes to quantum mechanics, it makes more sense to many of us to think of the probability wave function as a theoretical concept, rather than as a literal description of how the universe works. Regardless of which view you find more compelling, there are ways in which the Copenhagen interpretation helpfully distills the core paradoxes of quantum mechanics. Let's start with the most famous one, since it also involves a cat. And who doesn't love cats? Well, if you do, bear with me, because I'm talking about Schrodinger's cat in particular. This is the Austrian physicist whom we met very briefly in the last lecture. Schrodinger wanted to demonstrate one of the paradoxes that the Copenhagen interpretation presents. That is, that this interpretation seems to contradict common sense. Namely, he wanted to explore the idea that if a waveform describes a system, as we saw in the stock market example a minute ago, and it collapses to a point when we measure it, that is, when we specify a date and time, we get one value for a particular stock, that the stock must be valued at all possible amounts at the same time. 
Put another way, if we predict the velocity and position of an electron using a probability, this implies that it is in all possible places at once. To illustrate this paradox, he decided to use a cat in a thought experiment. Now, clearly he might have been a little bit of a sadist because he put a theoretical cat into a theoretical box along with some radioactive material and a Geiger counter, which is a tool for detecting radioactivity. If the Geiger counter detects radioactive decay, it will trigger the action of a hammer which will break a flask containing a poison which would kill the cat. Now, if you leave the cat in the box indefinitely, it will certainly die because the radioactive material will certainly have time to decay. But if you only leave the cat in the box for an hour, it may or may not live through the experience. It's possible that the radioactive material will decay, but it's also possible that it won't. When you seal the box, you don't know if the cat is alive or dead. It could be killed at any moment. But we can't see it, so we don't know. It's a little bit like a particle, which can exist in multiple states. But because we force it to choose a state when we observe it, we can't observe it without affecting the outcome. So what state is it in? Is the cat alive or dead? According to the Copenhagen interpretation, in the box, the cat is both alive and dead at the same time. The particle is in all possible states at once, and when we observe it, we force it to take one of the possible states. The state of existing in all possible states at the same time is called superposition. All of the possible states are described by the object's wave function. When we make an observation, superposition collapses and the object is forced into one of the states along its wave function. You might have heard the term superposition with reference to quantum mechanics in the past. It's an important corollary of the quantum theory in general and the Copenhagen interpretation in particular. The idea behind superposition is that if an object, particle, or system can exist in multiple states, arrangements of particles or fields, then the most general state, or the default state as it were, is a combination of all of these possibilities. Now, some states might be more likely than others due to an inherent stability or other factors. So the amount that each state contributes can be thought of as a weighted value. More likely states are given more weight. The double slit experiment in which the wave particle duality of light was observed, as we discussed in our last lecture, is also proof of the principle of superposition. Until we actually try to observe the photons directly, they pass through both slits at the same time. There's a related concept from quantum mechanics that comes into play when we talk about superposition, and that's entanglement. To help you understand it, let's start with a thought experiment. Jim and Jane are two theoretical physicists trying to figure out the quantum universe. To that end, they each have a particle that they are going to observe. Now, these particles happen to be part of a pair. They've become entangled. And their spins, therefore, cannot be the same at any given time. This might have happened, for example, if the two particles were created when a subatomic particle decayed, leaving these two entangled particles in its wake. So let's say that Jim takes his particle and puts it in a box, and Jane does the same with hers in another box. Let's also assume that there are only two states that the particles can be in. They can either have a spin that goes clockwise or one that goes counterclockwise. Before either of them has observed their particle, there is a 50-50 chance that the spin will be clockwise or counterclockwise for any given particle. But if Jane opens her box and sees that her particle is spinning clockwise, then Jim's particle must be spinning counterclockwise. You can also think of this experiment as though we took a single quarter representing the original subatomic particle and sliced it edgewise to create the entangled pair so that one person got heads and the other got tails. In the boxes, the allocation of heads and tails is random, but if one box has the head side, the other box must have the tail side. 
This capacity of paired particles to be linked, even if they are separated in space, is called entanglement. Quantum entanglement is a direct result of superposition, since before we observe the particles, they're described by a wave function that incorporates all their possible states. But when we measure one of them, the outcome of the other is instantly guaranteed. If you're uncomfortable with the idea that two things can be linked with each other even when they're miles apart, you're not alone. Einstein called it derisively, spooky action at a distance. Part of the problem with it is that it seems to imply that information can travel faster than the speed of light, because otherwise, how could one particle determine the state of the other instantly from miles away? And yet, not only does entanglement make accurate predictions that concur with observations, but it also already has some applications. And so, recognizing that nobody fully understands the phenomena of quantum theory yet, Let's turn to some examples of how it's already been applied. When you consider how truly small the nanoscopic world is, it's hard to believe that we've learned to build and manipulate things of that size. Some nanotechnology is one five thousandth the size of a sperm cell, one of the smallest cells in the human body. At that level of tininess, substances sometimes behave just as erratically as quantum mechanics predicts. But we can do some things there that are simply impossible at a macro scale. For example, there's currently no way to teleport humans through physical barriers. But we can send one electron through using quantum tunneling. Quantum tunneling is the process by which an electron passes through a barrier that classical physics predicts it shouldn't. To understand this conundrum, consider what classical physics would say about a ball trying to roll over a hill. Without sufficient energy or a push, the ball wouldn't be able to do it. It might roll up part of the hill, but as soon as it runs out of energy, it would roll right back down. If the hill was a wall instead, it would simply bounce off the wall, not go through it. But according to quantum mechanics, a quantum particle shows a wave particle duality, and its position and momentum can't be precisely determined, as the Heisenberg principle tells us. So we can't say with 100% certainty that the ball, if it was a quantum particle, can never pass through the wall or over the hill. There's a very small probability that it could tunnel through the hill or wall by borrowing energy from its surroundings and giving it back once it's on the other side. Quantum tunneling is thought to perhaps underlie radioactive decay, among other applications. Spontaneous DNA mutations also might result from quantum tunneling, but using protons rather than electrons. There's even a new microscope called the Scanning Tunneling Microscope that relies on quantum tunneling through a metal surface. What might the future of nanotechnology hold? Here's where the rabbit hole gets deep, and Alice and her white rabbit have a field day. What if we could build nanorobots that could perform delicate surgical procedures in our bodies without the need for a scalpel? Imagine if we could just drink a solution that contains the robots and let them do their work inside our bodies. Surgical scars would be a relic of history. Nanorobots could even make cosmetic improvements, altering your nose just the amount you want or changing your eye color. That idea is still a ways off. What's not so hard to imagine is the quantum computer, which is already in development. Quantum computation uses superposition and entanglement to perform its operations. Digital computers require data to be encoded into binary digits, bits, ones, and zeros, whereas a quantum computer represents data using quantum properties. Instead of bits, the quantum computer uses quantum bits or qubits, which can be ones, zeros, or both at the same time. What's more, at least in theory, quantum computers can be linked to one another via entanglement so as to operate in tandem. The power of such computing could dwarf that of the biggest and fastest digital computers in existence today. So far, the quantum computers that have been built are relatively limited because they use only a 
small number of qubits, ranging from 7 to 128 or thereabouts. But in May of 2013, Google announced the launch of the Quantum Artificial Intelligence Lab, co-hosted by NASA's Ames Research Center. This lab will house a 512 qubit quantum computer, and research teams from around the world will be invited to share time on it. Nanoscience often sounds like science fiction, and yet many of the most outlandish predictions of quantum mechanics have withstood the tests of time and experimentation. To take the instrumentalist view, just because phenomena are fuzzy in our minds doesn't mean we can't apply them. And if you think quantum mechanics is fuzzy, wait till we get to superstring theory up next. <laughs>